right, well, I'm going to share with you a passage of Scripture that, is, that has just been birthed in me for years. I want to start with Mark chapter 1, verse 40. Listen to what it says. A man with leprosy came to him, speaking of Jesus, and begged him on his knees, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus was indignant. What? If I'm willing? Another, another translation says, moved with compassion, he reached out his hand and touched the man. Can you imagine the healing that happened in that moment as Jesus touched him? That man most likely had not been touched for maybe decades, separated from his family, had to warn everyone, get away from me, I'm unclean, you can't come near me. You might get this horrific disease that I have. And in that moment, when Jesus could have just spoken, he reached out and touched that man. And I can imagine the emotional healing, the psychological healing, the spiritual healing that came to that man, as well as the physical healing that came rushing into his body because Jesus said, I am willing. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. Jesus sent him away at once with a strong warning. He said, see that you don't tell this to anyone, but go show yourself. Go show yourself to the priest and listen to this. Offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your your cleansing as a testimony to them. Instead, he went out and began to talk freely, spreading the news. As a result, Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but stayed outside in lonely places, yet the people still came to him from everywhere. Isn't it wild that Jesus tells this guy, hey, listen, don't tell anyone, and he runs out and tells everyone. Then Jesus rises from the dead and says, hey, disciples, go tell everyone. And we don't want to tell anyone. Isn't that weird? We should be telling everyone. We should be telling everyone, I once was this, but God has freed me. He has rescued me. I was a leper. You know what leprosy is? It's the perfect illustration of sin. It has all these outward manifestations, right, that you can see. You're sick. One thing it does is it causes separation between people that love each other so much. Families. You see people being torn apart between families and siblings and all of this craziness. That is a result of sin, the Bible says. It's death. It means to separate. And what did God say? In the day you eat, you shall surely die. They didn't fall over. Their body and spirit didn't separate at that moment, but their spirit and God's spirit did, didn't they? And all of a sudden, they were separated from their identity and their security and all of these things. And then brothers start killing each other and all this crazy separation starts happening all because, why? The inward condition. You see, is an inward condition that has outward manifestations. I know how many times you try to cover up, put the white garments over, and put the perfume on, and look the part, and all this kind of stuff. It's just from the inside out. You're just decaying, and there's nothing you can do. But Jesus speaks the word, and he touches this man, and in that moment, it says he is cleansed when he says, Be clean. You know what happens when Jesus, the one who spoke the universe into being, he speaks to you, whatever he tells you, he says, be clean. One word can change your whole life, can change your legacy with one word. So what in the world were these, the command that he said, go back and offer the the sacrifices that Moses commanded. I want to read it to you. It's in Leviticus 14, verse four through seven is part of this. It says, the priest shall order that two live clean birds and some cedar wood, scarlet yarn, and hyssop be brought for the person to be cleansed. Then the priest shall order that one of the birds be killed over fresh water in a clay pot. He is then to take the live bird and dip it together with the cedar wood, the scarlet yarn, and the hyssop into the blood of the bird that was killed over the fresh water. Seven times he shall sprinkle the one to be cleansed of the defiling disease and then pronounce them clean. After that, he is to release the live bird in the open fields. Now think about this. I mean, this is crazy. I'm going to try to tear this apart for you. And, but he's constantly saying the one that's to be cleansed, the one that's to be cleansed. But Jesus spoke to this leper and he was cleansed. He said, be clean, right? And what does it say? And instantly he was made clean. But then Jesus says, now go offer the sacrifices that are going to be for your cleansing. So I want to break this open for you 
and think about it real quickly. So think about what God told him. He said, you're going to take two clean birds, right? These two birds, they're going to represent something. And what you're going to do is you're going to take one of the birds and you're going to put them on this cedar little tr- uh, branch, right? They're going to tie these branches together in the shape of a cross. And they're going to take one of these little birds and they're going to tie its wings with little crimson ties. The other bird, they're going to kill that bird and drain its blood into this water. It has to be water from a running stream. It can't be from some stagnant pond somewhere. And it has to be drained into an earthen vessel. Then you take this bird and you dunk it in the blood and the water and the hyssop with the, cis- the, the cypress branch, right? And then pull this bird out and you're going to find out what you're supposed to do. But think with me, what in the world is this earthen vessel? I believe it points to maybe a couple different things. One, it points to the incarnation that Jesus, God himself, is going to put on flesh. and He's going to dwell among men, me and you. He's going to become a man. God is going to become a man, 100% God, 100% man. But then, not only the incarnation, but listen carefully to me, you know how the term reincarnation is used. I'm not using it that way, but there is in one sense a reincarnation. Listen carefully to me, because God, Jesus, descended to heaven, and he says, listen, now I'm sending my spirit, and I'm calling you my body. You are to be re- in the reincarnation, in a sense, of Jesus Christ with skin on, walking around, representing him with his spirit inside of you. And so he had it in an earthen vessel to say, listen, I want this glory that is in me that's going to come into you. I want to shine through an earthen vessel. Are you guys with me? Next, it was supposed to be, they were supposed to be dunked in blood. In blood. You know, there is a fountain that we all have to go in. The fountain filled with blood, drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunged And those, right, lose all their guilt and stain. It's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful song. Then it had to be mixed with water. And it couldn't be from a stagnant string or or from a stagnant pond. Like I told you, it had to be running water because that water represents something. It represents something. What is at every birth? You know what's at every birth? Blood and water at every birth. So when Christ was birthing his church, us, when that spear went in his side, normally you put a spear in someone's side, blood will come out, but blood and water came from his side because God was birthing his bride right there. Now, that cedar wood is very special because it lives by dying. That's how it lives. And Christ says, listen, if you're going to be cleansed by me, you have to take my pattern of living. Here it is. If you try to save your life, what's going to happen? you will lose it. But if you lose your life for my sake, he says, you will find it. Because if you're my follower, if you're my disciple, you're going to give up your life. You're not going to cling to it because you have the real thing. You're not going to hold to this vapor. You're going to hold to the author. You're going to hold to the finisher of your faith, the one who created life, who is life according to him. And he says, this is eternal life to what? Know him. And that word know, Adam knew Eve and they bore sons and daughters, right? When you know Christ, he says, that is eternal life. Is anybody with me? That is eternal life, to know him. So they had to then sprinkle the blood and this water on this once leper who is to be cleansed, right? Seven times. Picture of Naaman going into the Jordan River. I had the privilege of doing this over in Israel, being baptized in the Jordan River seven times. Beautiful, absolutely beautiful. But Jesus shed his blood seven different ways for us. And it was a symbol, that priest was a symbol of the high priest, Jesus himself, sprinkling us seven times the number of completion. I'm going to purify you. I'm going to cleanse every wrong motive, every wrong desire, every wrong attitude, every thought, everything. I'm sprinkling you in my blood and with the water of my word and the water of my spirit. And so how did he do that? Two in his feet, two in his wrist. He was beaten on his back, right? A crown of thorns on his head and a spear in his side. Seven times Jesus sprinkled us with his blood and water. So then also there had to be hyssop in that water. Can you imagine this leper 
who is dying from this inward condition with all these outward manifestations, and no matter how many white outfits he puts on, he still smells like death because that's what he is. He's just walking, literally existing while he's decaying. And yet he goes and he goes and washes himself. And what does he say? That now you come out smelling like the fragrance of Jesus Christ. That's what he's wanting. I believe that's what that hyssop is, is representing. You know what that hyssop was for? When they were in Egypt and the, the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed, they would take hyssop and they would get that blood of the Passover lamb. And that was what they used as a paintbrush to apply the blood of Jesus Christ over the doorpost of their home. It is the exact same thing that they took and gave Jesus the vinegar, water, water, right? And the wine vinegar on the cross was a hyssop plant. And he's saying not only does it serve the purpose of, of, uh, of fragrance, a wonderful smell, right? So when you're crushed for doing righteousness, ultimately what should happen? Christ aromas should come from your body like literally like a rose being crushed but it also has is a cleansing agent david says this in psalms 51 purge me with hyssop and i will be clean wash me and i will be whiter than snow you know there's a story of a man who was riding on a train and as he's riding by he's looking out the window to the right and as he's looking he's just looking at so many places that are ran down but he sees this one place that just looks so nice and he's admiring it as he goes by. And then he goes to his trip and uh, spends a couple of days here. He's headed back and he happens to be looking, glancing the same direction. And he, and he notices this place that he says, why doesn't people whitewash their home? Why don't they keep, you know, keep up their places and things? You know, the difference was he realized that he, had, he was looking at the very same piece of property and the very same house. But on this way, he saw it against a backdrop of all the foliage and all the greenery and things, but it had snowed for a couple of days and there was pure white all around this home. And now when he looked at it, he saw that it wasn't quite as clean as he thought it was. You see, when we compare ourselves with other people, we can look in the mirror and we can admire ourselves and think we're doing so great. Look to Jesus. Look to Jesus, the absolute perfection of love. Brian, if you could grab me a drink, I would appreciate it. So, there was also a scarlet thread that that little bird was tied down with. Think with me for a moment. The imagery was this, is the one that was slayed, right? And their blood was, draw was poured in here. You would think that it would be the other way around because God has the other little bird tied to the cross and be dipped in the blood and the water and then those little crimson ties were cut and that little dirty bird flew to freedom. But you know what the scriptures say? Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, but not I, but Christ in me. You guys with me? So, a scarlet ribbon, thank you. I got two of them now. A scarlet <laughs> ribbon was what Rahab hung out of her window. And when those walls of Jericho, that cursed city, fell because she had that one red ribbon hanging out her window, that house stood and she got to bring her entire family into this place that was going to be saved because she put her faith representing in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. You see that crimson little thing hanging out her her uh, window was a sign, I'm putting my faith in Messiah. I'm putting my faith in this covenant partner that I, that I love from here on out. So Psalms 22, listen to this. It is called the Psalm of the Cross. It was written a thousand years before Christ gave his life. Verse one says this, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The most painful cry in human history as Jesus and his father were separated so that we could be united. They lived in perfect unity for all eternity. And in this moment, there's separation so that we can live with Christ forever. It's so absolutely beautiful. Verse six in Psalms 22 says this, but I am a worm and no man. 
I am a worm. And David the prophet, I believe, is prophesying about Jesus Christ. Worms are considered the lowest part of creation. Job, when he have, had leeches all over his body, read the book of Job and see what this man went through. He had leeches trying to suck out all of this infection as this man was just in so much pain and agony. And he says, literally, he likens himself to a worm. He's like, I can't go any lower in life than where I am. I've lost everything. I have no hope. I'm in pain, tormented day and night. I'm a worm. Usually in the Bible, the Hebrew word, word for worm is rimna, which means maggot. But listen to this. The word Jesus uses here for worm means crimson or the scarlet worm. Crimson, the crimson worm reproduces one time in its life. And the mother worm will find a tree and she will climb up this thing and she will attach herself to this piece of wood or to this tree. And it is attaches itself so strongly that if you grab the outer shell of that worm and you try to pull it off, she will not let go and it will pull her body apart. The outer shell will come right off before she will let go. It reminds me of how Christ was held to that cross. He was not held by a few nails. He was held by the love that he has for his father, his father's will, and for the joy of having you be the lover of his soul for all eternity. That's what held Jesus to the cross, love. As he was mocked and ridiculed and everything else, nothing could pull him off of that cross because love was holding him on there. Next, it's not forced up there. It climbs up there on its own. Jesus says, no one takes my life from me. No one. Matter of fact, they took Jesus and tried to put him, push him off a cliff. He walked through. Why? Because he says, no, I'm the one who's going to lay my life down. I'm the good shepherd who lays his life down for the sheep. Now's not the time. When the time comes, you know what? I'm going to give myself up to that cross. Here's someone that could speak, literally the commander of the Lord's army. One angel came down and killed around 185,000 men one night. And Jesus has legions of angels at his command. But instead of calling down angels or speaking to that tree and say, you don't even exist right now, or whatever he wanted to do, turn off the sun, man, he can say whatever, but he hangs there out of his love for you and me. It's mind boggling. Next, these crimson worms, they lay their eggs under their protective shell. I believe it's just such a beautiful picture of being under the protection of this covenant with Jesus Christ. When the baby worms or the larva hats, they stay under the shell. Do you realize at the Passover, when that was initiated in Egypt, you realize that they had to examine the lamb. They would bring that lamb into their home for days. They would check no broken bones. This is the perfect lamb. Can you imagine? I would be absolutely foolish and terrified to bring my entire family up here and say, hey, guys, tell the church if you've ever seen me have a bad attitude. But Jesus... He stands in front of men that have been living with him for three years and a host of others. Just can anybody condemn me of anything wrong? He's examining. He's the perfect sacrifice. Never sinned in word, thought, or deed. But after they examined him, they had to offer him as the sacrifice. Then they had to apply the blood of that sacrifice over the doorpost of their home. It's not enough that just Jesus died for you. Have you applied the blood? Fathers, listen to me, okay? I'm not gonna try to flesh this out, but I'm gonna tell you symbolically, this is God's desire, that the man would take this, the blood of Jesus, right? Representing the blood of Jesus, and he would apply this over the doorpost of his home. And when that death angel came, because of that man being faithful and responsible, he says, as for me and my house, we're gonna serve the Lord. And that death angel would pass over the entire family because that man applied the blood of Jesus over his life. Have I repented of my sins? Have I renounced them? Have I turned? Have I said, as for me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. I'm praying for my kids. I'm fasting. I don't care what I got to do, but they're all coming, right? That's what I'm claiming for Jesus, right? That's what I'm challenging each man to have you applied it, not just for yourself, but for your family. Are you standing at the door of your house? It's extremely, extremely important. But not only, listen, they still, this, this, it wasn't over yet. Not only do they have to examine the lamb and offer the lamb, they had to apply the lamb, but then they had to go in and remain in the house. It says, don't forsake gathering together as the practice of some, but all the more as you see those days approaching. Where are you going? Right? He says, come to the fellowship of believers. Stay around the things of God with the people of God. It's extremely important. Next, 
You know what he says? Is that you've got to eat of the lamb. The whole lamb had to be eaten. So if you didn't have enough people to eat the lamb, you'd bring, invite other people into your home so the whole lamb could be eaten. So many people want Jesus just for forgiveness. He's your peace. He's your joy. He's your wisdom. He's your power. He's everything. You got to eat of him every single day. He's your life. He's everything. Next, listen carefully. The mother's body gives protection for her babies, but also provides food for them. What does Jesus say? He says, I am the bread of life. Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part with me. No part with me. So, after three days, by the way, the mother would give up its life to provide life for its babies. Life himself embraced death so that he could transfer this Zoe life into you. That even when this life, what we call life, fades, that you literally are attached to life himself. And he says, not even one hair of your head is going to ultimately be harmed. Because to be absent with the body, to be present with the Lord, an eternal bliss that you can't possibly imagine if you truly know him like I'm talking about today. So after three days, this dead mother's body loses its crimson color and turns into a white wax. The wax is harvested and used to make a shellac, a preservative of wood. The resurrection serves as a preservative of the message of the cross of Jesus Christ. And one thing about this message, guys, is that when this mother is giving birth and, and, and to this, these larvae, right, what happens is she stains them with this crimson color as she's giving her life. And from there on, not only is she stained, but that piece of wood is stained and her children are, cha are, are stained for their entire life. That's where they get their name, crimson worm. It's not supposed to be in a moment of emotion that you come up here and you say, Jesus, please forgive me. And then you walk out and nothing changes. There could be nothing further from the mind of Christ than that but that you come in a moment of surrender and you come to yielding and submission to God and complete unity where there's fruitfulness and faithfulness for the rest of your life and you get brought to heaven and rewarded for the life of faithfulness that he empowers you to live through his grace. That's what God, that you are stained, that you are marked children of his with the blood and the water of the spirit. So, Leviticus Chapter 14, verse 8 says this, the person to be cleansed must wash their clothes. What? This is the person that Jesus, this, we're talking about a person that Jesus, this is the command. Here's a man that Jesus says, you're, you're healed, you're cleansed. Now go and offer the sacrifices and do what Moses said to do. What did Moses say to do? The person to be cleansed if they hadn't already been cleansed from their leprosy, they wouldn't be there at the, at the, with the priest, would they? They weren't allowed at the temple. So they were already cleansed from their leprosy, but they've got their outer garments on. They've got all these nasty clothes on. And he says, here's what you got to do. You got to wash your clothes. Let me tell you something. If you were a leper and all of a sudden Jesus says, you're healed, you're cleansed. I want to do it. And I'm happy to do it. Be clean. The last thing you're going to want to do is hold to your nasty, leprous, filthy, stinky garments. It says, literally, hating the very thing, stained with sin, right? Those garments stained with sin. Get that, get that gross stuff off of me, right? You know, you, I couldn't pay you to put that back on. So he says, wash those garments. You've already been cleansed. I'm not fi fixing my leprosy by washing my clothes or taking a bath or shaving. This has nothing to do with me being righteous, Right? But he says, listen, you do your part. Make sure there's no infection around any hair of your body, right? Make sure you've washed those clothes and you take a bath. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Never does it say work for your salvation because you can't do it. But if he's done it, he's spoken over you and he's touched your heart, 
He's the one that cleansed you, but you have a process. You have a part in the process to work out your salvation led by the Holy Spirit that should be in you, and he is if you've invited him in. So what is this, this water? He says, bathe in water, then, listen to what he says, then they will be ceremonially clean. Jesus has already spoken to this man. He's been healed of his leprosy. He says, now go to the temple, show yourself to the priest, do all this stuff, start washing yourself, you know, wash your clothes, do all this stuff. And he says, then you will be ceremonially clean. In other words, salvation is you were saved, you are being saved, and you will be saved. From the very presence, you're going to be glorified one day. You with me? So he says, you are clean, praise God, but there's more cleansing so you're going to be ceremonially clean. I want you to take part in this. This is you working out your salvation without fear and trembling. Listen to what, what Matthew Henry says in his commentary. He says, the running water signifies the power and grace of the blessed spirit who is compared to rivers of living water. And it is by his work that the righteousness of Christ is applied to us for our cleansing. Those who promise themselves benefit by the righteousness of Christ, while they submit not to the grace and influence of the Holy Spirit, do but deceive themselves. We cannot be purified by the ashes otherwise than in the running water. Now, he specifically, this is taken from a different part of the text where they have, they're offering a, a, um, a, a bull. Same exact principle. He's saying, listen, so many people think they're going to heaven because Jesus died on the cross. Let me tell you something. He died on the cross to forgive you, to start a relationship with you, to come live inside of you so that his spirit can wash you every moment of every day that you have this. I didn't marry my wife and say, here, I got that plaque on the wall. Now I don't have to worry about that anymore, right? It was to fall in love with her and get to know her more and to spend the rest of my life with her, delighting in her and bearing fruit through our relationship together. That's what it was all about. It wasn't about me saying, I don't ever want to talk to you again because I already made that covenant with you. There could be nothing more sick than that. So, when we are washed, I believe those wa that water can represent many different things. One, it is the water of the word. As you're reading the word as a disciple, what is happening? God is washing you and cleansing you every moment. Do you know what? When I lay down, God reminds me of the word. When I get up, he reminds me. The first thing I do, try to get into the word because it's like I'm, a little, I'm like a little kid at Christmas time. I know he's going to show me something new. I know he's going to show me something new. He's going to teach me. He's going to come. He's going to be with me in that moment. And then he's going to remind me throughout the day of his word because his spirit is in me. And if he's in you, he's going to constantly remind you of the truth. So when you have this beautiful relationship with the spirit of God, he is in a constant cleansing you. It's not like he takes some old muddy rock out and washes it up and sets it there and then the moment the next car drives by and just boom, you're all muddy again. And you just live there and say, well, thank God he washed me up at one time. No, he takes this muddy old filthy stone, right? And he brings it over and it's like he sets it under Niagara Falls. And so every moment, there's not one second of your life when you're sleeping or when you're awake that he's not cleansing you, saying, son, that thought doesn't really please me. This is not like me, right? And so he's cleansing, cleansing you of every thought, every word. David says, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing in your sight. So the Holy Spirit is constantly living in, in you, that water of his word and the water of his spirit. And I believe this is a consecration step right here, the waters of baptism, representing a burial to self and a resurrection unto Christ. All of those are part of this process that God says, yes, I cleansed you and I made you whole. Now let's do something about those stinky clothes and let's get you bathed up and let's get you showered up and shaved, right? We got some things to do. We are a prince or a princess in the kingdom and you've been made whole. Let's start acting like it. So it's really wild because this power to walk in this way comes from that water portion. As a man was driving down the road, he looked in this field and he saw this man that was pumping. It was, it was not even human how fast this man was pumping water. He's just cranking, 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 and water is literally shooting out of the ground. And this man stops and looks and starts looking at his watch. And he's watching this thing for a minute, Two minutes, this guy's just pumping, 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 and he's still going. He's like, how can any human, first of all, even pump that fast? Second, have that kind of perseverance and ability to stamina? 
So he drives over in his curiosity as he gets closer and closer and closer. He realizes the farmer has set up this mechanism and put these hinges here and made this little cut out of a man. And literally he's got this thing in the water and the water's coming gushing out of the ground and it is driving the man. The man's not pushing the water out. It's the exact opposite. Paul says, I'm working. You think this is in the flesh? I'm working with the power of his spirit that's working mightily in me that this, everything, he says, when people look at your life and they say, how in the world? He gets the glory. He gets the glory because it's him through the power of his spirit. That's what God is wanting. So listen to Leviticus 14, verse 8. After this, they come into the camp, but they must stay outside their tent for seven days. Oh, hold up a second. This guy's been, you're clean. He's got evidence. Look, I don't have any, I don't have it anymore. I've washed my clothes. I've taken a bath. I've shaved. I've done all this. He says, fine, you can come into the camp. You can come into the people of God, right? But you cannot be in the most intimate of relationships because there's a seven day cleansing process. So this man couldn't go into his tent. He couldn't be intimate with his wife. He couldn't do these things because it was a time of separation. You know what I believe happens so many times? That people are cleansed. You're, they're cleansed. I mean, they've been made whole. And they come into the church and they say, hey, this is a great social club and this and that and the other. And they miss the whole point. You can miss the whole point. Just developing friendships here and miss the whole point of ultimately it is for intimacy with the king to be ushered into the bridal chamber to go into the holy of holies with Jesus himself. I'm not saying this doesn't have a part. It absolutely does. What an incredible step of privilege to be able to come in to the people of God and have this fellowship that it's such a means of grace that we encourage each other daily so that the deceitfulness of sin does not overtake us. But if we just stop with this, then we miss it. Leviticus 14 verse 9 says, On the seventh day, they must shave off all their hair. They must shave their head, their beard, their eyebrows, and the rest of their hair. They must wash their clothes and bathe themselves with water. And are you with me? They will be clean. This guy has been cleansed and cleaned and cleansed and cleaned. And, and now he's, he will be clean. I believe it points to a work of grace in your life. Another point where God brings you to absolute purification of your life. Where God empowers you through purity. It's such a beautiful, beautiful picture. So he says in verse 10, on the eighth day, which is really wild because that was the day that the Jewish boys would be circumcised. And that is the day medically that you have the most vitamin K in your body, proportion, those little guys, the proportional for their whole life. That's the, the number one day. It's also the day they have the most blood in their body on day number eight. And it is the day that God called them to be set apart going through this process to symbolize their sanctification, saying, listen, I'm set apart to God. They must bring two male lambs and one ewe lamb, a year old, each without defect, along with three tenths of an ephah of the finest flour mixed with olive oil for a grain offering and one log of oil. I wish I had time to really go into that but I believe it's such a beautiful picture of the Trinity, very possibly. There was two male lambs and one ewe lamb. And I'm not saying that one person of the Trinity is female, but I am saying this as I see characteristics of the Holy Spirit that I see so powerfully in my wife that he is the comforter. That's one of his main roles. And when my kids fall down, you know what I do? I teach them how not to have that happen again. Do you know why that happens? So I go before the event and after the event. I do it every time. It's just naturally. Like, you know what happened? This is why you're going to get it. You know how to keep that from happening again? And you my wife said, would you be quiet? Come here. <laughs> and she's trying to comfort them in the moment, right? I'm thinking it's more loving to keep it from happening again and again or teach them why it happened in the first place. But she's all about, stop all that. I want to comfort you. I want to comfort you. And this is what I know in 2 Corinthians 5.19, verse or B, it says this, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. That yes, it was Jesus. He's our Messiah that hung on that cross physically. But it says, I don't even pretend, pretend to know what all this means. But the God the Father was there. And I believe the Holy Spirit was there. Can you imagine the comforter, how much suffering he went 
through to watch Jesus Christ laying his life down for us. And it says that God, the Father, literally was in Christ as he's reconciling the world unto himself. So Leviticus 14 verses 12 through 18 says this, Then the priest is to take one of the male lambs and offer it as a guilt or a trespass offering. Along with the log of oil, he shall wave them before the Lord as a wave offering. What in the world is that? A wave offering was a thanks offering. So you had a, you had, I'm going to share with you quickly, four different sacrifices that these people were commanded to make if you were healed of leprosy. One, a trespass offering. We've all sinned. The Bible says all of us have sinned. If you say you haven't sinned, you've tricked yourself. You're deceived. You're lying, my friend. Right? So we've all sinned. So he says there's a trespass offering. This is what I did. If you confess your sins, it's saying the same thing about your sin. I did it. But then there's a sin offering. The trespass offering is dealing with the sins, the specific things that God says, you did this and you did that. It would be wrong to me confess something that I didn't do in a trespass offering. But there may be some, maybe many that have never confessed what they've done to God. And you think God has cleansed you from it. But he says, I want to identify it. I want you to confess it. And I want to apply that blood over that sin. But the sin offering was not just about the specific sins. It was dealing with the source of those sins. It was saying, you know what that is? You see that little wound right there, but that signifies there's a much deeper problem. There's something on the inside of me. There's a bent that's wrong. That's why I'm lustful and greedy and prideful and arrogant and all these different things. Yeah, here's the specifically how it came out. Here's how it manifested that I need forgiveness for. But there's a source, there's a root, and God wants to destroy it. Now, the next offering was a wave offering. If you have been forgiven, I'm not having to bring a sacrifice saying this is, this is to say what I've done. But this say, God, thank you for forgiving me for forgiving me for what I have done. And this sacrifice is to say, I'm enjoying sweet fellowship with God. And so I want to thank him and praise him every minute of the day. And this is my sacrifice that I'm waving before you to say, thank you. If you've been cleansed, have you offered a thanks offering to God? Or have you grown cold? It says this, the priest is to take some of the blood of the guilt offering and put it on the lobe of the right ear of the one to be cleansed, on the thumb of the right hand and on the big toe of the right foot. The priest shall then take some of the log of oil, pour it on the palm of his left hand, dip it in his forefinger in the oil of his palm and his finger, and with his finger sprinkle some of it before the Lord seven times. When the people of God and the Old Testament would come to the temple, they would go and they would offer a sacrifice that points to Jesus Christ dying to the cross, a blood sacrifice. Then they would come to the labor and they would wash. I believe that, that, that signifies the Holy Spirit, his work in your life, right? Water baptism, the water of the word, these sanctification processes that God is describing in here. Then the priest would come and they had to wait for seven days and only then would they be anointed with oil. And when they were anointed with oil, they didn't just sit out here and listen to things about God. They were then invited to go back into the holy place. And into, one was invited to go to the holy of holies. But when Jesus died on the cross, that veil was torn and the holy of holies come exploding out, hopefully into you, the temple of God, and that you have the incredible intimacy with God all the time that you live back there with him or he with you.